Hello beautiful people, how are we all today? I hope you guys are having a great day. Welcome or welcome back to Trapped by Love. My name is Emma Carrington and if you are interested in true crime and justice you are in the right place. So I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button because we'd love to have you join us. By way of disclaimer, we discuss true crime cases involving domestic abuse and domestic homicide on this channel in an effort to raise awareness. So if this is not the kind of content you are looking for, I completely understand. Thanks for stopping by. Now, if you are listening on any pod platform and ever want to see the images that go along with these cases, you can find us on YouTube at Trapped by Love. But wherever you are, please know that I appreciate you. Today we are looking at the Australian case of Tara Brown. I must say that a lot of my research for this episode came from a documentary that was released only on the 22nd of June this year, as well as documents from the Coroner's Court of Queensland. You can find the documentary on the Tara Brown Foundation page, and I'll put a link to that page in the show notes. Now let's go ahead and get into today's case. Tara was the eldest child in her family, born to her mum, Natalie, on the 21st of March in 1991 in New Zealand. She was a vibrant child with a ready smile and loving nature. She grew into a beautiful woman with a positive attitude who never had a bad word to say about anyone. Tara's mum, Natalie, says she was empathetic, warm and trusting, and she had a love of life from a very young age. Tara was a talented athlete who played touch football at a representative level. She had great friends who she spent most of her time with. So when they hadn't heard from her on a weekend in 2011, her friend Kylie texted her asking, where are you? And Tara told her that she was catching up with an old friend. Tara's friends soon found out that that old friend was Lionel Patia. Lionel and Tara had gone to school together, but they'd never really been friends, much less had a relationship. But this chance meeting set them on a fast track into a relationship. And within three months of being together, Tara found out she was pregnant. Unbeknownst to Tara, Lionel had a history of domestic violence. Lionel's previous girlfriend, ended a three-year relationship with him in November of 2009 because he was frequently violent and whenever they argued he would lose his temper very quickly and would punch her. There are reports that Lionel pushed his previous partner to the ground and kicked her in the head numerous times on a number of occasions. He was also very possessive during and after the end of the relationship with her. Tara's friend Shelley describes Tara as a kind, beautiful, soft spirit who wanted a family. She wanted children and Lionel knew this and promised her the family that she craved. However, not long after all these promises, Lionel informed Tara that he had joined the outlaw motorcycle gang, the Banditos, as an enforcer or sergeant in arms. Tara was devastated. She didn't know what to do. And when her friends questioned her about it because they'd seen photos on Facebook of Lionel wearing gang patches, Tara told them that, yes, he joined and that she'd been trying desperately to convince him to leave, to get out, but that he wasn't listening to her. Her friends were scared for her at this point. Tara's friends say that they even saw a change in Lionel's behaviour after joining the gang. They say he became ruthless. There's a level of grooming and conditioning that goes into getting someone to join a gang. The tactics they use are very much like those used in an abusive relationship. Prospects are slowly exposed to increasing violence and they become more and more accustomed to it until it becomes a way of life. Tara's mum says she saw a change in their relationship. She says initially Tara was a girlfriend to Lionel, but as he got more and more involved with the gang, Tara became less autonomous. She became Lionel's possession, his to show off. Natalie goes on to say that Lionel drained Tara emotionally and mentally to the point that she was a shell of her formerly vibrant self. The signs of control became more obvious to Tara's friends as well around six to eight months into the relationship. They recall not seeing her as much. The fact that Tara was not allowed to go to the beach or to visit friends and family, they noticed that Lionel was beginning to isolate her. And if she ever was out with them, Lionel was calling and texting incessantly. 
asking where she was. And he wasn't happy with a general, we're headed to the beach. He wanted specifics, streets, sets of lights, what shops she could see. Her friends could see that Tara was always on edge. They tried to talk to her about it, but Tara wouldn't open up. When Tara would travel for away games with her touch football team, Lionel would make sure she stayed separately, paying for a room in a different hotel because there were males on her team. Now, I say that Lionel paid for a room for her, but in reality, Lionel controlled all of Tara's money, so he wasn't really parting with anything that was his. Another friend claimed Lionel often demanded to know what Tara was wearing at any given time and would label her a slut and accuse her of cheating on him. While pregnant, there are reports that Tara was strangled and pushed down the stairs by Lionel, who then threatened to slit their dog's throat and bash her brother. Tara first reported the violence to police after an incident that occurred when she was 33 weeks pregnant in June of 2012. She'd stopped at a service station to get a chocolate bar. Because of this, Lionel became so angry he ripped off her dress spat at her, threw a bucket at her, and called her a, quote, putrid dog mongrel slut. Tara was too fearful to make a formal complaint, but also revealed to police that her partner had threatened her with a handgun and smashed her windscreen. This began the on and off cycle of their relationship. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to stop right here. These behaviours are obviously all red flags, and unfortunately, Tara's response to her friend's questions and concerns is fairly common. There's fear behind her hesitation to confide in anyone. In her heart, she knows what she's dealing with is wrong. But remember that what you see as an outsider is only the tip of the iceberg. If you are ever in a position like this with a friend, please don't push. Just reassure them that the behavior they're dealing with is not normal in any relationship and they deserve better and that you're there for them no matter what. Okay, that's my public service announcement for the day. I'll get off my soapbox. Tara's friend Kylie tells of an incident when Tara was heavily pregnant. Lionel was at the motorcycle gang clubhouse and Tara had gone around to see her friend. They spent some time together until Lionel called wanting food and needing to be picked up. So Tara went to pick him up. But because she hadn't brought him the food, he ripped all her clothes off and threw garbage bins at her car in front of all his friends. After this event, Tara called her mum, who found her daughter wrapped in a sarong that she'd thankfully found in the back of her car. Natalie helped her daughter into her own car as she wept. She was crushed. Tara's car had a broken windshield and the side mirrors had been kicked off. Lionel had also taken the keys and thrown them leaving a pregnant Tara stranded. Natalie took Tara to the police station to report what had happened and file for a DVPO, a domestic violence protection order. Tara ultimately decided not to press charges though because she was afraid of the consequences. She was granted that protection order. In May of 2012, Tara went into labor with her daughter. Lionel took her to the hospital, and when Tara's mum came into the hospital room excited to support her daughter, Lionel, insulted that she had ignored him when she came in, stomped out of the room, and after about an hour, Tara's mobile rang. When she answered, Lionel screamed down the phone that her mum was a rude <laughs> and that he was going to slit her throat. He was so loud that even though he wasn't on speaker, not only Natalie, but the hospital staff in the room heard the threat and notified security. They finally relented when Tara pleaded for him to be able to be in the room when her child was born. On the 28th of July in 2012, Lionel was arrested for breaching the conditions of the DVPO. This wasn't the first time. Tara had had Lionel around to visit to see their daughter, but upon requesting him to leave after he refused to help with the baby, Lionel became angry. He yelled at Tara, threw food at her, and smeared a burger on the windscreen of her car. Tara contacted police, upset and scared. Lionel was charged with breaching the DVPO and was again sentenced to one month imprisonment, suspended for two years. This was two weeks after his previous conviction 
They just kept giving him suspended sentences. I don't understand. He's not getting the picture. When their daughter was two months old, Lionel called his mother during an argument with Tara to come and get him and the child. She did. And after this, Tara called her own mum beside herself. Natalie ended up calling Lionel's mother and asked for her to bring the baby back. When she did, Tara left with her mum and took her daughter to stay with her mum and her mum's new partner. She knew that Lionel didn't know where this house was. She managed to avoid being found for two months, but the calls and texts kept coming. And one day a message came through that he knew where she was. She went to the police to report the breach of the DVPO and the police picked Lionel up because this was the third time in a matter of months that he'd breached the DVPO. He went to prison to serve all the prior suspended sentences. Finally. However, once he was released, he played the I want to see my child card and once he had access to Tara again, he began wearing her down promising he'd changed, that he loved her, that he would respect her and they could be a family until she relented. Then, as it goes, the relationship went back to business as usual and Tara was afraid to leave because Lionel would threaten to kill her or himself if she ever tried to leave him. His threats then extended to her mum, her brother and even her grandparents. Tara was working at a law firm as a personal assistant from the time her daughter was one, and Lionel made this as difficult as possible. Even though he enjoyed spending the money her job brought in, he would call her constantly at work, to the point where, if she was working, someone else had to answer the phone the entire shift. Her boss says that Lionel would never attend any of their work dinners or functions, but he would sit outside in the car waiting for Tara when she attended. In 2014, the firm introduced a locked door policy where their clients would have to call to obtain access to the office because Lionel was continually showing up. Natalie says that Lionel controlled Tara in every way. He controlled her financially, sexually, mentally, and emotionally. Whenever Tara did leave, Lionel would call her repeatedly, and if he couldn't get hold of her, he would call harassing her friends, asking for any and all information on Tara, who she was seeing, where she was. He was constantly convinced she was seeing someone new. In 2015, Tara was trying to pack up and leave before Lionel returned to the house, but she only got as far as the driveway before Lionel showed up and took video of her as she cowered in the drive and he hurled abuse at her. He then went on to post the video to Facebook before dragging her back into the house where he held scissors to her throat and strangled her. This went on for between 10 and 20 minutes before Lionel's aunt arrived and intervened. It was after this attack that Tara confided in her boss Jason who was horrified at what she'd been dealing with. He could see she was in total fear and he set about trying to get her safely away from Lionel and to secure full custody of her three-year-old daughter. Tara's mum arrived at the office after picking her granddaughter up from daycare to find Tara and her boss organising her escape. Natalie saw the fear in her daughter, but she realised that she was leaving for good this time and she was relieved to see that she had the support of her colleagues. After contacting DV Connect, Tara was set up in a hotel for the night before going to a refuge the next day. During the intake by both DV Connect and the refuge, Tara's situation was deemed high risk. In fact, they found that there were 27 lethal risk factors. Tara also went to the police to report the assault and to request a DVPO on the 3rd of September. Her solicitor called ahead to the Southport Police Station to request a private room for Tara to be able to discuss her fears, but police failed to provide a room or to even take a statement when Tara arrived at the station. Instead, they asked her why she hadn't come to get a protection order on the day of the attack, three days prior, if she was so afraid. And even though Tara was being bombarded with text messages while she was there at the police station and she showed the constable what Lionel was sending her. He looked at some and considered that there were no direct threats of violence. He didn't consider the fact that she'd been sent hundreds of messages in the space of hours, and this constitutes domestic and family violence, which is a massive oversight. 
The constable Tyra was speaking with took down Tyra's report of events, but recorded them incorrectly. This constable also spoke to his shift supervisor, a sergeant, and both concluded that they had no evidence to confirm domestic and family violence had occurred. In fact, the sergeant told Ethical Standards Command investigators it was, quote, commonplace for women to make false allegations of domestic and family violence to further their position in relation to family court matters. I need to take a breath because that absolutely infuriates me. So with all of this, they denied her a DVPO on this day. In the days following, while Tara and her daughter were at the refuge, Lionel went around to all of her family and friends' homes, repeatedly looking for them. He went everywhere, including Tara's workplace and their little girl's daycare centre. Tara's solicitor was in contact with Lionel's counsel to arrange for their daughter's visitation on Sunday the 6th of September for Father's Day. The orders stated that Tara would drop off their daughter at Lionel's aunt's house 30 minutes before he was to arrive, so there wouldn't be any chance of contact between them. On the Saturday, Tara left the refuge and stayed on the Gold Coast so she could drop her daughter off the next morning. She then went back to collect her that evening. Tara was encouraged after the successful visitation. So on the Monday wanting to return to her life, including her work on the Gold Coast, she returned to the safe house where she'd been staying to pick up her things. She then went back to her aunt's place that night, planning to go back to work on Tuesday, the 8th of September, 2015. Lionel had lulled her into a false sense of security. On the morning of Tuesday, the 8th of September, 2015, Tara dropped her daughter off at daycare and set off to start her day but Lionel was laying in wait. And as soon as she drove away from the centre, he pursued her hatchback Mazda 2 in his Jeep Cherokee four-wheel drive. Tara tried to escape him, but he followed her. Witnesses say they saw the vehicles travelling at speeds of in excess of 100 kilometres an hour. Tara had to stop at traffic lights at an intersection, so Lionel drove his car around and pulled up in front of her. He then got out of his car and approached Tara's car. He punched her Mazda four or five times. Tara evaded him and drove off. Lionel got back into his car and followed her. Tara was forced again to stop at another set of lights and Lionel left his vehicle once again, pounding on her car. Tara drove off again with Lionel following close behind. By this time, Tara had called triple zero and was screaming for help. It was at this point that Lionel used his car to ram Tara's car. This caused her vehicle to swerve and leave the road. Tara's car was forced over a three metre high embankment and into the front yard of a house below. Her car came to rest on its side, driver's side down. Residents and passers-by came to Tara's assistance. She was calling out for help. Lionel drove about 70 metres further down the road, then parked his car in the middle of the road. He jumped from the Jeep and ran back to where Tara had crashed. But at the corner of the street, he stopped to remove a 25 centimetre square solid steel fire hydrant cover from the footpath and then continued on to where Tara was trapped in the car. The steel cover he picked up weighed 7.8 kilograms. Lionel approached the car and a neighbour helped him break the windscreen to gain access to Tara, assuming that he was there to assist her. It wasn't until they heard her crying out that they realised that he was not helping, but instead beating her. And they tried to stop him, but he fought them off. Lionel leaned through the windscreen and struck Tara in the face multiple times with the hydrant cover. The neighbour attempted to stop him by pulling him away from Tara, but Lionel freed himself and began striking Tara again. Lionel then climbed inside Tara's car and knelt on her chest, and continued to hit her with the steel cover. The triple zero call was still in progress and recorded 16 strikes. Emergency operators listened helplessly as Tara cried for help, saying, Lionel, stop, please help me. The 26 blows inflicted by Lionel to Tara's head and face left her with brain damage that was not survivable. And her poor mum 
was the one who had to decide when to remove her life support. Many people came to say goodbye to the young mum and her life support was turned off at 5pm on the day of the attack. However, Tara didn't pass until the following day. She was 24. Lionel was charged with Tara's murder and they were set to go to trial before he changed his plea to guilty at the last minute. Outside court, Gold Coast lawyer Campbell McCullum read out a statement on behalf of Lionel Patea. Quote, I do not wish to cause Tara's family any further pain or delay their need for justice, he said. I accept without reservation the punishment proposed upon me by the justice system today. I will also ultimately be judged by God. I know Tara will never be forgotten, nor will I ever be forgiven. End quote. Lionel was sentenced to life in the Brisbane Supreme Court on February 27, 2017. In 2018, Lionel was sentenced to a second life term for an unrelated murder, which investigations showed he had committed two months before he killed Tara. He was also charged with an assault on another inmate in November of 2016 while he was on remand at the Arthur Gorey Correctional Centre in Queensland for Tara's murder. He was sentenced to 18 months after pleading guilty to pouring boiling water on the inmate. Well, he said, very hot water. Anyway, this was after the other inmate apparently called him a derogatory name and challenged him to a fight. When it came out that Tara had tried to obtain a protection order just five days before her murder, Tara's mum gave an interview to the Nine Network and she spoke about the inaction of the police when her daughter had gone to them for help. She said, Lionel Patia had a record as long as our arms. He was known for his violent behaviour. He was known as a bandito bikey and Tara was scared. She was hoping the police would put in place the domestic violence order. Natalie said her daughter feared for her life and that she told the police that. There was an ESC investigation into the way the officers had handled Tara's situation. The investigation discovered a raft of failings, including that the shift supervisor, Sergeant, was unaware of the domestic violence protective assessment framework checklist used by police to determine the seriousness of domestic violence incidents, which was implemented in 2012. That is three years before Tara went to them for help. Considering the prevalence of DV and the fact attending to domestic abuse is a massive amount of their workload, you would think that the police would be the most well-versed in all aspects of handling these incidents. For them not to have even been bothered to be across the existence, not just that he didn't use it, but he didn't even know that there was a tool that was available to assess the seriousness of a domestic violence incident. That seems like a deliberate decision to not educate himself on handling domestic abuse. I'm ranting, I know, I'm sorry. The police investigation also found the shift supervisor, Sergeant, failed in his duty to properly supervise the constable or to ensure action to investigate the allegations of domestic and family violence were taken, which was a breach of discipline and there was grounds for disciplinary action. So in a statement, the Queensland Police Service said that as a result of the internal investigation, two members were the subject of disciplinary action with one officer disciplined and the second retiring prior to this occurring. Ah uh, yeah, he just went, I'm out of here, disgraceful. After all of this, Lionel penned a letter to Tara's family Natalie has said that she will not ever read it, saying his apology could have happened before his actions. It's worth nothing now that Tara's gone. She goes on to say that nothing he could say could excuse the explosion of violence that robbed a very young girl of her mother. The deplorable letter that was tendered to the court said, quote, There are no words that can possibly describe how remorseful I am for the events leading up to and on September the 8th of 2015. Nothing I can say can bring Tara back. Nothing I can do can get her returning home to us. If there was, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would like to apologise from the bottom of my heart to both sides of our family, especially to her late father, Patrick. Pat, 
I really let you down. I would like to apologize to my daughter. These events and outcomes are simply un unspeakable and I only have myself to blame. So many people have been affected by this. The question that haunts us all, how such a tragedy like this could ha ever have happened. Just a sec. I'm sorry, what? You and your entitlement are how this tragedy occurred. It goes on to say, Unfortunately, I don't have the answers and I can't clarify it for myself either. I hope today in court gives everyone personally involved some sort of closure. Tara was everything to me. Those of you that were close to her, those of you that were close to us all know that, all know how my son rose and set for her. She was my everything, still is. Tara was a dream catch, that one in a million girl. Beautiful, gentle, warm, kind-hearted and loving. My own angel on earth. That is how she will always be remembered by me. That is how I want her to be remembered by everyone else too. My daughter has lost a mum and dad. Both families lose. A mother, daughter, father, sister and son. There is no winning here. It's a loss for everybody involved. My actions were unforgivable and I do not expect forgiveness. I am not expecting any leniency from the Crown here today either. Life in jail is only one part of my sentence. Living out our days without Tara is part two. The hardest sentence of all? One day I'm going to have to explain to my daughter what happened to Mummy. As she grows older, I expect her features and her demeanour will be constant reminders of how beautiful her mother was. The likeness in her being so familiar, like mother, like daughter. I will endeavour to rehabilitate whilst in custody. Maybe one day I can help prevent another occurrence like this from ever happening again. I pray that Tara's legacy thrives and lives on in my daughter. Signed, Lionel John Patia. Breathe. <laughs> so he's going to rehabilitate behind bars. Good on you. You do that, you piece of human excrement. I hope the prison guards are privy to your very best self for all the rest of your days, you prick. Nobody cares. Tara's little girl is in the loving care of her grandmother, Natalie, whose heart has to have been torn to shreds over and over again every time the sweet little girl asks for her mummy. I can only pray they are healing and living a joy-filled, peaceful life. Natalie and her partner founded the Tara Brown Foundation. They say the aim is to raise awareness and funds for women's shelters and refuges in a bid to support people in need of immediate help. They say we have close contact with these women's charities and keep a close eye on the ones that are struggling most. The statement on the website says, our goal is to raise funds to upgrade and assist needy refuges and women's shelters and any other worthwhile DV organisation that helps women and their children escape violent and controlling partners. We will send funds to existing organisations that may be struggling financially and are sincerely in need of our help. I will put the link to the Tara Brown Foundation in the show notes and the description box below for you if you're interested in donating or in watching the documentary that I mentioned earlier. And my darlings, if you have made it this far, I thank you so much for taking the time to hear Tara's case. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please let me know what you think in the comments box below or over on Twitter or Discord, the links to which are in the show notes. This is where you will also find the link to my second channel, which is an educational channel discussing, what else, but domestic abuse. I know, get a hobby. If the content of this case has raised any concerns for you regarding your own relationship or that of a loved one, please reach out for help. There is a list of resources in the show notes and the description box below. My aim in covering these cases is to honor the victims of these crimes and to get their stories out there in the hopes of warning others who may face similar situations. The hope is the more people who recognize the red flags and warning signs of abusive relationships, the less prevalent these cases will be in the future. I thank you again for joining me this week. And until next time, please take care of yourselves and be kind to one another. Bye.